to uh, open up a little bit this morning. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Amen? Amen. And the, Paul tells us that when he is weak, that's when God is strong. So it's like, let me see if I can put it this way. It's like if you're a coach of a football team or a baseball team or a, a hockey team or a rugby team or whatever, and you have, you have players that know what they're doing and they have it together and they don't need as much help as other people. But then you have the young man that, or young woman that isn't quite coordinated, can't really run that fast, doesn't really kick the ball that well, forget throwing a baseball, but yet they want to be involved. What do you do with that person? Oh, Johnny, go sit over there and I'll, I'll get to you later. No, it's Johnny, come on, brother. Let's, let's work on this, let's get you at this. Last thing you want to do is kick him to the curb. Because as soon as you kick him to the curb, then they begin to feel more useless than them when they first started the, the, the thing. I think that is that is a lot of believers are that way. I can't speak as well as that guy. I don't read out loud as well as that guy, so please don't ask me to pray out loud. I can't do that as well as that guy. You know, he does everything so much better than me. But Jesus calls us all the same. And I like when, if you read the scriptures, and every time someone was lacking in something, Jesus was the first one on scene. How many times did the apostles try to talk Jesus out of doing something? Oh, you don't need to go over there. They're, they're going to be okay. And Jesus says, no, that's exactly where I need to be. I need to be right there. For some reason, we as believers, we see things going on around us that we think, you know, I'm not going to touch that. When we should be right in the middle of it. At least in prayer. Amen? And I'm going to read this scripture again. I've probably read it 15 times in the past couple of years, but I'm going to read it again. And the reason why I'm going to read it again is because it needs to be not only in the time that we live in, but our whole entire lives. Because this one scripture basically says the whole kaboom. But we just don't want to read it just to read it. We want to read it to feed off of it. Amen? And when you feed off of something, what happens to it? It becomes part of you, doesn't it? So my favorite saying is eat, pray, and read. Eat the scriptures, pray the scriptures, and feed on the scriptures. So I'm going to read this again, and and you bear with me. I don't want to hear that again. No, you're going to hear it again. <laughs> he who dwells in the shelter of the Most High. What scripture is that? Yes. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress my God in whom I trust. For it is he who delivers you from the snare of the trapper and from the deadly pestilence he will cover you with his pinions. And under his wings you may seek refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and bulwark. You might not be afraid of the terror by night. You will not be afraid of the terror by night or the arrow that flies by day. Of the pestilence that stalks in darkness, or the destruction that lays waste at noon. A thousand may fall at your right side, and ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not approach you. You will look only, you will only look on with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked. For you have made the Lord my refuge, even the most high your dwelling place. No evil will befall you nor will any plague come near your tent. For he will give his angels charge concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will bear you up in their hands,
sins, lest you strike your foot against a stone. You will tread upon the lion and cobra, the young lion, the serpent, you will trample down. Because he has loved me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him securely on high, because he has known my name. He will call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. With a long life I will satisfy him, and let him behold my salvation. This word, folks, is powerful, and it's alive. And if, if we walk around all day, every day in a funk, whose fault is that? Mine. Yours. Because the word is what brings us the power to succeed in life. I'm not talking about the world view of life. I'm talking about God's view of life. We just finished a series on the abundant life and what it means. It all begins with seek him first. If we understand that this scripture is meant for you and I, then the power of that scripture dwells in you and I. The Bible says the Word became flesh and dwelt among you, lives in you. So the reason why I'm presenting this to you again this morning is because the enemy who is trying to destroy you through publicity, through bad reports, through lies and everything else, his main goal is to bring you to a place where God is not big enough anymore. Did God really say? Did God really say? Everything God says is yes and amen. And God allows us to do things so that he can produce in us the desire that he has for us, not our desire, his desire. How many of you have ever been involved in sports before of any kind? And there was also an exercise or a or a something that you had to do to prepare for that athletic event or whatever. It was work, wasn't it? I used to make fun of those that were in chess clubs and, and debate teams. Oh man, yeah, blah, 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 blah. There's nothing involved in that. Until you start debating one, then you realize, wait a minute. And that's where we are with the enemy. The enemy cannot debate you. For one reason and one reason only, he became flesh and dwelt among you. Christian, quit being depressed. Christian, look up at your reward. Christian, keep your eyes off a of man and put them on him. Come on, church. Christians. I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen to me. I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what's going to happen to my friend. I don't know what's going to happen to this. I don't know what's going to happen to that. And God says, keep your eyes on me and you let me worry about that. What do you tell Peter? Peter, you don't worry about him. You come follow me. Christian, quit doubting your walk. Christian, walk by faith and not by sight. We were singing this morning those songs, and Lord just impressed me that there's too many of God's believers walking around with a funk, walking around with a cloud over their head. How come they don't listen? Why don't they do this? I don't understand. All you need to do is put your life in his hands, and everything else will come and be accomplished. Amen. This morning I want to speak on, we've all heard about the blood of the cross. This morning I want to speak on the blood of his cross. His cross.
cross. I remember John Boyle used to have a, a, a favorite scripture, probably many favorite scriptures, but one that he always said is, take up your cross daily. Take up your cross daily and follow me. Colossians chapter 1. Heavenly Father, Holy Spirit of God, I pray you come this morning and anoint our words, anoint our hearts, anoint our lips, anoint our voices, and let us see us in you, not us in the world. You, you and you alone will bring us from the destruction of this world. And I don't mean the planet. I don't mean the trees. I don't mean the rocks. I mean the spiritual leadership of this planet has his finger on us to destroy us. But God is bigger than the God of this world. And I don't mean big G. I mean little G. Satan thinks he's in control, but he's not. Open our hearts this morning to your word, Lord.
Can't happen. You might fail in your neighbor's eyes. You might fail in the eyes of the person sitting next to you at the pew or on the chair. You might fail in everybody's eyes, but you will never fail in God's eyes if your purpose is to seek the kingdom of God first. All through him to reconcile all things to himself, verse 20 says, having made peace through the blood of his cross, through him, I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven. One of the most wonderful statements in the entire body concerning the unique character of our Lord Jesus Christ is found in Colossians 1, 14 through 20. One of the most wonderful statements in the entire Bible concerning the unique character of our Lord Jesus Christ is found in the scriptures that we read this morning. You might say to yourself, what about all them other wonderful scriptures? Think about the, what these few verses impacted. If you look closely, they begin and close with a reference to the redeeming blood of his cross. As if this was the basis for his glorious preeminence. The basis of his cross. The reason he came for his cross to pay a price that he didn't owe. To pay a price that we could never pay. His cross that we might be forgiven for sin. Well, Pastor, sin really ain't that big of a deal, really? Well, it says in here, I can't do this, I can't do that, I can't do this, and, and what can I do? Listen to me, folks. Jesus came and separated you from the law in the New Testament. Because God knew that we could not follow the law to the letter of the law, so he had to send a Redeemer, Jesus Christ, for the perfect sacrifice that he needed, not that we needed, he needed out of so much love for us that we can once again be in fellowship with Almighty Creator God. There are two questions we must ask and try to answer. The first question is why does the blood of what does the blood of his cross mean? The blood of his cross must be distinguished from the blood of every other cross. How many Crosses were on the hill when Jesus was crucified. Three. Were the other two crosses as important as his cross? How much of the dude hanging on it was. But not to us. Out of those three crosses, one was received into glory. Remember? And Jesus paid the ultimate price. All the blood of humanity could be spilled on crosses but it would not atone for one sin in the sight of God. You could hang people on crosses until the cows come home, but it doesn't matter. Only one cross matters. This was his cross. And all that he was in his holy humanity was represented on that cross, his cross. In his divine dignity, glory, Honor was sacrificed on his cross. I don't know if you can imagine, have any of you ever been bullied in your younger years? It kind of takes something out of you, doesn't it? You lose some dignity, you lose some pride, you lose some, some, some go-aheadness, if I can use that term. Because when you're bullied and you're and you're being you're being dehumanized. You feel less of yourself than you did in the beginning. But Jesus took it all. All the ridicule. All the hate. All the, the, the perversion that went on calling names. Who knows what was actually said. I cannot imagine for a minute being in, in the place where they, they beat him and, and, and put thorns of on his head and, and put him robes and beat him with, with nine tails. I cannot imagine seeing it because 
There is no movie made today that can present what actually took place. They get pretty close, can't they? There's movies out there you got to go, oh, man. But it doesn't depict everything that he went through. You cannot imagine on the way to his cross, skin falling off his back. You cannot imagine walking in his cross, carrying his own cross, with his face being ripped up. Because I'll guarantee you they didn't take that nine tails and just strike his back. You can imagine him taking his cross and walking down the Via Della Rosa with meat hanging off of his legs. Yay. Hands broken. Arms broken. And I don't mean literally. I mean shredded, stripped, bone. The life was in the blood. And what a life it was. What a life Jesus represented for us on the earth. All of the precious and immeasurable worth of the life of God is here represented in the blood of Christ. We don't think about that, do we, though? We don't think about how precious and how insurmountable and how, and how ruthless it was. And I'll tell you why I know we don't think about that as often as we should. It's because we still walk around with what was me written across our foreheads. We still walk around with kick me because I'm down, strapped tattooed on our backs. We still walk around with long, faith, long faces because people don't like you because you're preaching the word. Oh well. If we're not honest with people that we're sharing the gospel with or we're afraid to share the truth with them, don't share it. And don't pretend either. Don't be like that fig leaf. All nice and shiny and, and beautiful and the stem all nice and shiny, but no fruit. Because we have to understand what the blood meant, what the cross meant. The pouring out of his blood on the cross was the pouring out of his soul. Wow. The pouring out of his soul was the pouring out of his blood. We treat Jesus too lightly. We don't treat him with the, 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 the um, dignity that he deserves. If you don't get a prayer answered, what do you do? Oh, I guess God doesn't love me today. How come you didn't hear my prayer? How come you don't hear, you hear everybody else's prayer? How come you don't hear my prayer? I can almost hear him say this. Walk with me. Walk with me. Have a relationship with me. I'm not saying God doesn't answer the prayer of the young God because he does. There's miracles out there, isn't there? All over the place. But that's God trying to show people, hey, I'm here. With all of its infinite wealth and purity, love and power, he gave himself for us. I learned a long time ago that if I keep the us in front of me, I fail to realize the me. Christ did all that for me. And us is in there somewhere, don't get me wrong, but he did it for me. He came to the cross, shed his blood for me. The blood of Christ shed for our sins is that which stands for all that Christ himself is before God in, in our behalf. All that he is before God on our behalf, in our behalf. Our behalf. People that use his name in vain have no respect for the creator God or Jesus the Son, or Holy Spirit. We don't have the respect 
that we should have for the Trinity, for God Almighty, Jesus the Son, God the Holy Spirit. It's time for God's people to quit playing the game and start getting in the fight. And what do I mean by that? Your victory is already won. You've already got a big stamp of pain and fool across your forehead, your chest, or wherever he decides to put it. But we still have to be in the fight. We still have to be vocal for Christ. There's not the value we may be able to set on the blood of Christ, but the value that God sets on it. Did you get that? It might not be the value that we put on the blood of Christ, but what matters is the value that God puts on the blood of Christ. God puts more value on his son's blood than we as humans, reckless, selfish people can ever put on it. God did it, for he so loved the world that he sent his one and only Question number two, what has the blood of his cross secured? It has laid the basis by which God can righteously justify the ungodly. It has laid the basis so God can righteously justify the ungodly. The blood of Christ has opened a channel through which the saving mercy of God can joyfully flow joyfully flow out to the uttermost parts of the earth and into the uttermost part depths of human need. God's love, Jesus' blood, goes to the uttermost parts of the earth and to the uttermost depths of humanity, of our human we're coming to the point in creation that God's about ready to pull the biggest miracle he's ever pulled before in his life, which is eternal. Raising Jesus out of the ground, resurrecting him was a pretty big thing, wasn't it? But can you imagine for a minute when, when Jesus, the son, comes back? The Bible says the whole world will see him. The Bible says he's coming back with the saints. Which tells me we're going to be with him before the misery even starts. We think we're going through something now? Hello. The Bible says he's going to come back with the saints when he steps his feet on the mount. That is going to be something to behold. The Bible says there will be blood, horse halter high. Can you imagine for a minute? Blood, horse halter high. But Jesus shed his blood so you and I don't have to be there. Through the blood of his cross, there is propitiation. Turn with me to 1 John chapter 2. Or write it down. Whatever you want to do. 1 John chapter 2. We'll go to verse 2. My little children, I am writing these things that you may not sin, and if anyone sins, we have the, an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he himself is a propitiation or the satisfaction for our sins, and not ours only, but also for those of the whole world. 
His propitiation for our sins satisfies God's requirement for a perfect sacrifice, a perfect blood sacrifice. His blood has gave us redemption. First Peter chapter 1, verse 18 says this, knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood as of a lamb, unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. You've been redeemed by the blood of Jesus. I wish I, knew, I wish I knew the words of that song I've been redeemed because I think I tried to sing it, but I don't know the words. Isn't there, isn't there a song called I've been redeemed? Yeah. Yeah, I, I, won't, I, won't, I won't mess you up by singing it. Okay? <laughs> Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7. We have forgiveness because of his blood, because of his cross, the blood of his cross. Ephesians 1, 7 says this. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. The forgiveness of our trespasses. Through his blood. Hebrews 9.13 says this, because of his blood, we've been cleansed. We have a cleansing. So I think we as believers need to picture ourselves in these things, don't we? We have to picture ourselves as being, we've been, our, our sins been satisfied by the blood of his cross. We have redemption from the blood of his cross. We have forgiveness for the blood of his cross. We are cleansed, made clean by the blood of his cross. Galatians 1.20 says we have peace, the blood of his cross. We have peace that surpasses all and any understanding. Ephesians 2.13 says we have nearness says this, but now in Christ Jesus, you who formerly were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Ephesians 2.13. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were formerly were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. How many of you in here have ever experienced a relationship with an adult that you always felt like you had to be your best behavior every time that you were around, every time you did something, wrong or right? My stepfather demanded perfection. Perfection that he knew no one could achieve. So, in his demanding perfection, it gave him the right in his eyes and the ability in his eyes to torment me, to abuse me, because he knew that I could never meet up to his standards. But aren't you glad that Jesus has set his standards at a place where you and I can rise up to? And let's think for a second. Sometimes we think, oh man, I got to get up there. Jesus says, no, let me come down here a little bit. And I'll walk with you. And I'll talk with you. And I'll treat you as one of my own. We have liberty through his blood. Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 
10. And we'll read verse 17 through 20. And their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. Now where there is forgiveness of these things, there is no longer any offering for sin. Since therefore, brethren, we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he inaugurated for us through the veil that is his flesh. He allowed us to have liberty through the removal of his flesh. And what do I mean by removal? By what he went through. The scourgings, the beatings. So that we can walk in the grace and his, mer and his mercy of his blood. You remember the the curtain in the tabernacle when the Bible says that when Jesus died, the, the curtain ripped from top to bottom. That curtain was 60 feet tall and it was an inch thick. And it was woven, so you can only imagine how tough it was. But it was ripped from the top to the bottom. That curtain in the temple symbolized Jesus' flesh. Jesus' fleshly curtain. That when that happened, he now separated or kept us from being separated by something fleshly in the world. We can now have full fellowship with God, with God because of what Jesus allowed by tearing of the curtain. I don't know about you, but sometimes I sit in my chair and I ponder and I ask a question, why? Why? My wife and I were talking the other day and she said, why didn't God just inhale or, or give us this papaya drink or, or tell us to go do this 14 times and, and to, to go accomplish this and you'll be saved? But then you realize that God needed a perfect blood, unblemished blood sacrifice for the atonement of sin. Some of us think sin so lightly that we really fail to realize how devastating it is in our walk with the Lord. We're forgiven. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We're God one eye. But that doesn't mean we have the freedom to continue in sin. Paul says, shall we continue in sin so grace may abound? God forbid. Jesus paid the ultimate price once and for all for me. Nothing else I have to do except acknowledge Him and walk in His light, to walk in His perfect will, and to seek Him first. And if I fail, I ask for forgiveness. No man-made covering is long enough or strong enough to hide an unforgiving sin from the eye of Him who is the judge of all the earth. You can't hide it. You can't comb the closet and do it because it's going to come out. What's the Bible says? What you do in secret will be shouted from the rooftops. This just, this just came into my brain. When you take advantage of a person because they are a Christian, and you think whatever you ask is their responsibility just to. You gotta think. You gotta think. And your number one, to answer your question, brother, the number one thing is you ain't doing that no more. I have a responsibility. 
to my God and my maker and my creator. I have responsibility to the blood of Jesus Christ to be a right just steward after what he's given me. Whether it's word, whether it's deed, whether it's slavery, or whether it's what I have. We have the responsibility to say no. In love, but no. Jesus says, quit casting your pearl before swine. Stop it. Stop trying to convince someone who will never be convinced. Why? It's because they don't open up the book. They don't listen to the word. They only believe what they want to believe. One day they're going to stand before God and he's going to ask them, why should I let you in my heaven? And you're going to have all kinds of excuses. But the only reason is this. The blood of Jesus Christ has made me whole. Well, come into my peace. Come into my joy. Well, I really thought my friend so-and-so, I would get, no, 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 no. Jesus is the only way. Your friend isn't. I am, and I'm sure that God's a lot more lenient than I am, unless you read the Old Testament. He was pretty, pretty angry a lot, especially at the Israelites. But I am certain that if God expects good fruit to come out of you because of what he's already accomplished, don't make an inch, a, a, a Imitation fruit. And what do I mean by that? By putting on your shining glory. By putting on all your best. Putting on your best behavior. Bringing the biggest, fattest Bible you can find to church. Saying, all of, oh, that's so wonderful. You got your leaf all shined up. You got your fruit all shined up. And then you walk out and guess what? Your fruit is made of plastic. It isn't even real fruit. We need to turn our lives around and realize what Jesus had accomplished on his cross for you and I. There's too many believers that make excuses not to walk in the righteousness of God, even though we already are the righteousness of God. And the reason why I'm speaking to believers today, to Christians today, is because nine times out of ten, the Christian gets tired. I can't do this no more. Why? It's because you're doing it in you. you got to do it in him. There's no covering long enough or strong enough to hide an uncovered, unforgiving sin from the eye of him who is judge of all the earth shall sit upon the great bright throne. You're not going to get away with it. His blood was poured out not only to pay the debt of sin, but to put sin away and to redeem the sinner out of all iniquity. Isn't that something? He redeemed us to put sin away. Past, present, and future. Son, sin no longer abides in you. No longer who you were, no longer who you are, and no longer who you're going to be. He has thrown that into the deepest parts of the ocean, and he says, I will remember it no more. No more. You know what? When God says, I remember it no more, it's like he's taking that little wand, taking that little thought out of his head, and throwing it away. We need to do that. <laughs> we need to be able to do that because the blood has made it possible. But sometimes our own worst enemies are ourselves and those that we know closest. Those that we know closest always want to remind you of who you were. Tell me about it. And your response should be, you know what? Have I been that way after the cross? Well, not as bad. Have I been that way after the cross? Well, to a degree, hit my face, hit my knees, get on my face, Lord, forgive me for that. I don't want to be that dude no more. No, no. 
And if I begin to walk somewhere now where I don't need to walk in, don't let me go there. If you have to send someone up behind me and hit me with your word, then do it. But I'm not, I, don't want, I don't want to go there. And whatever's in front of me in the future, block it from coming and being a part of my eyeball. Amen. The price was himself, and his price was all sufficient. The freeness and the fullness of this forgiveness is according to the freeness and fullness of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Wow. Not according to any merit or works of my own, but according to his mercy. His mercy, his grace has saved us. You know, I was talking to my pastor, well, it's been a while now, and I said, how would you like to be a new pastor or a younger pastor or a pastor in today's way things go? As much as this man loves God, he loves a disciple man, I heard this, I wouldn't. There's no way I would. And I said, can you tell me why? He said, because the difference between then and now is huge. Then People that came to know, when people come to know Jesus, they dug in, they bore in, they prayed, they seek God, they they nothing. They were always there's something always something around, isn't there? Always, always has been. But nowadays, it's like the commitment level hasn't reached the place where it should. And if you look around and think about people that you know, and, and you have to realize, okay, maybe he's right. It's too easy for the enemy to influence our decisions nowadays. Not according to anything that we've done, but all that he's done, according to his mercy. While we live in the light of his presence. Now, think of that for a minute. The life of his presence. You can, you can walk up and down the street all day long. I used to do that. Oh, you're a Christian? Yeah, I'm a Christian. Oh, 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 can you share with me? I don't know. Beat you over the head with it. Or, they beat you over the head with it. While they turn around and head to some place where they shouldn't be. They didn't understand for that. So the thing is, is when we put on a picture of who we are supposed to be, we better be who we Now, we fail, right? We're human. We fail every day, don't we? But the difference is this. Lord, examine my heart. And don't pull your Holy Spirit from me. Never take credit for nothing. While we live in His presence, the ever-effectual blood of Christ keeps continually purging away everything that would mar us and our fellowship with one another or hinder our fitness for His service. Fellowship with one another. Fellowship with one another. Fellowship with one another. Unfortunately, in the times and age that we live in now, sometimes the only fellowship we can have is in a meeting like this. But there are people that won't even join into that fellowship for whatever reason. Even though the Bible says, do not forsake the gathering of yourselves together. What's amazing about it is they are so self-righteous on other things, but when it comes to certain things, I can't do it. But Christ and his blood brings us into the presence of his life. Hinders, we can't let anything purging or allow everything that needs to be purged away from us to continue our fellowship one with another or hinder our fitness for his service. The cross of Christ is such an overpowering manifestation of the goodness of God that we have but to see it in to have the intimate, intimate intimacy of God's heart slain. When we we have to realize that the heart of God was put on the cross also. In his son, the heart of God, the love of God, the peace of God was on the cross also for the ultimate sacrifice that we can all be set free and have relationships.
relationship with the Father. Such an overpowering, overpowering manifestation of God's goodness. 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 The cross. To have fellowship with sin is to be away from God. To have fellowship with the death of Christ is to be made worthy. This is the nearness of a child born into the family of God and finding its resting place in the arms of his everlasting love. Some of us still don't feel that presence. Some of us are still looking for that confirmation. Some of us are still walking after that feel-good feeling. In reality, there's no better feel-good feeling to know that you've been bought and paid for by the blood of Christ for the redemption of your sin, for the forgiveness of your sin, so you can walk in liberty and freedom and have a nearness to God that we've never experienced before the cross. That's the beauty of it. A light, as light removes darkness. Oh, so the blood of Christ removes distance. As light removes darkness, as the blood of Christ removes distance. What does that say to you? That says to you that there's no more a void. There's no longer a void between me and my creator. Jesus has brought that void together. There's no more crevice. There's no more, there's no more cliff to bail. There's, no, there's nothing else left to do except enjoy the fellowship. I cannot imagine. I cannot even think. My little mind doesn't even understand sitting in a room and having God speak to me. Hallelujah. But he does. Hallelujah. Lord, was that you? Who else would it be? <laughs> Lord, what would you say? Well, listen next time. <laughs> and I can't, I mean, I know you've heard me say this before, but God has told me many, many times, if you be quiet long enough, I can say something. Amen. But every time God speaks to us, we should just go, oh, oh man, God's talking. Oh man. But we don't, I don't think we follow or understand God. I think the Holy Spirit has to bring revelation to us, God. I think the Holy Spirit has to reveal to us God. Because our human flesh just can't understand someone just breathing and life existing. We can't understand a, 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 a being so powerful that spoke the sun and the moon and the stars into existence. Our minds can't fathom the lightning bolts going to the throne room and said, what do you want us today? Oh, speak to Michael, he'll tell you. I cannot imagine standing at the ocean line and realize that God says you can go that far and no further. I cannot imagine a God that looks at the fruit tree and says you're going to blossom this to this, you're going to have fruit from here to here. Why? It's because I said so. I cannot imagine walking across the field and seeing all the flowers and all the birds and all the bugs and, and everything else and realize God said be. And I cannot imagine God being so lonely that he takes a clump of clay, mashes it all around, lays it out in the ground, and then breathes life into the dirt. And here we come. I cannot imagine God seeing us being so lonely as man. He says, you know what, guys? This, he, needs a, 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 he needs a companion. Then he says, Adam, come here, take a nap. Adam takes a nap. God digs into his rib, pulls out a woman. Here's your companion. I can't imagine that. We take God for so granted that we take the blood that was shed for us to grant it also. His cross, his blood was for the redemption once and for all. 
see them so overbearing that we begin to doubt what we believe. We begin to doubt what we know and our knower to be true because this individual just, is, you know, it, it, he or she's meant so much to us over the years. So when I try to present truth and they, they don't like that particular part of truth, it makes me feel inferior. In reality, you should be able to say, you know what, this is what God said, and this is what I believe. If you believe it, if not, I'm sorry. But the last thing we need to do is begin to tower under the things of the world that, try to, that, that tries to bring us into a confirmation or a, uh, a what's the right word, a uh, commitment thwarting idea of the world. Sometimes we allow ourselves to come into a compromising situation and forget to speak the truth and walk in it simply because someone doesn't believe it. The blood of Christ has given us what we need. I could be up here all day, but I better stop. <laughs> and just, it's a shame that we get an hour with you a week. Probably won't get thank God. But anyway, the blood of his cross of his cross. And when he says to take up our cross and follow him daily, there's things that the world wants to try to prevent you from doing. Your Christian walk is not free. It's not easy. You're not going to get any out of voice until you hear those words well done. And then he says, come into my peace. Finally. But we can't give it up now. We gotta walk. We gotta talk. We gotta share. We gotta be in season and out of season. Paul tells Timothy to Timothy to rightly divide the word of truth. Father, thank you for this opportunity we've had to come and learn hopefully something. Thank you, Lord, that we can come and understand that your blood, your cross, and your blood that was shed for us is eternal. We're so thankful that we have the total forgiveness of every sin that we've ever committed, ever have committed, and ever will commit. This morning, Lord, I pray that you would just do a miracle within each and every life, each and every family that's represented here, a miracle. And Lord, always help us to keep our head held high because you are our light as we walk in this darkness. In Jesus' name.